The puffin is one of the most widely recognized seabirds. They stand out with their brightly colored bills, distinctive eye markings, and bright orange feet. People love puffins and their endearing looks. As a byproduct, they have earned the nicknames the sea parrot and the clown of the sea. There's even a line of popular breakfast cereal named after them. But within this dapper bird is a wealth of courage, perseverance, and commitment. Puffins aren't a type of penguin, but an auk, in the family Alcidae. There are four types of puffin in the world. Three are found in the genus Fratercula. It consists of the Atlantic puffin, the tufted puffin, and the horned puffin. The fourth is the rhinoceros auklet, found in a different genus. The Atlantic puffin is the only species of puffin along the Atlantic coast. The other three are found in the Pacific. Of all of the puffins, the Atlantic is the smallest, standing at about 10 to 11 inches tall. The puffin's crisp suit of black and white feathers is what gave rise to the genus name of Fratricula. It's Latin for little brother of the north, with little brother referring to the black and white robes worn by friars. Their black backs and white bellies serve an important purpose. It's a method of camouflage known as countershading. Black helps conceal them from aerial predators against the dark backdrop of the sea. For those lurking under the surface, the white underparts blend in nicely with sunlit waters and bright sky. And of course, it must be asked, why were they named puffins? It is believed that the puffin chicks, known as pufflings, are responsible for this one. The chicks are round and covered with fluffy down feathers, giving it an adorable puffed look with a beak and feet. The breeding season takes place from about April to August. During this time, they can be found along the coasts of Maine in the United States, Newfoundland in Labrador, Nova Scotia, Greenland, Iceland, Ireland, the UK, Scandinavia, Russia, and the Faroe Islands. 60% of Atlantic puffins breed along the coast of Iceland. This is the only time they come to land. Otherwise, they can be found at sea. They were built for a marine environment, with wings adapted for both air and water. And because they are diving birds, their feet are placed far back on their bodies and act like a scuba diver's fins when searching for prey. The pictures we see of puffins are usually when they are in their breeding plumage. During this time, their beaks and feet become bright orange. The sear and lamella grow yellow plates, eye ornaments develop, and the eye ring turns red. The fleshy skin at the corner of their beak, called the gape rosette, becomes larger and bright yellow. This is in stark contrast to the remaining two-thirds of the year. As the breeding season draws to a close, the puffin sheds its colorful plumage in exchange for more drab, subtle colors. They lose the eye ornaments, their toucan-colored beak becomes a dull shade of orange, and their bright white faces take on a sooty gray color. This plumage isn't often seen by humans, as they are usually far out at sea, but occasionally, one shows up to the breeding grounds still in winter garb. The winter season for puffins is a solitary and quiet time. They are usually alone or with one other puffin. Their waterproofed feathers keep them dry. They spend their days foraging for fish and drinking salt water. They have a built-in desalination filter in the form of salt glands and salt ducts that allow them to expel the salt through their nostrils. But take a closer look. Where are their nostrils? It's hard to see unless you're looking for it, but it's a linear slit located on both sides of the upper mandible. Puffins can live an average of about 30 years. They take several years to mature, reaching breeding age around five years old. Young puffins don't start out with the well-defined beaks we see in adults, but instead have one that is much narrower and charcoal gray or blackish. With each passing year, the beak becomes more convex and develops a full or partial vertical groove, indicating which year of life it is in, similar to tree rings. A first-year puffin will usually have a trace of a groove. In the second year, it may have one groove that is mostly, if not all, developed. In the third year, it may have one and a half grooves. In the fourth year, two complete grooves. 
Some birds stop at two groups, and others will develop two and a trace of a third. We often see a picture of a puffin with a beak full of silvery fish. This is a puffin who has gone out to sea to get food for its chick. The fish it hunts are small schooling fish, such as caplin, sand eels, herring, and cod. It carries an average of 10 fish in its beak at a time, and sometimes more. Their dives can be as deep as 200 feet. They can hold their breath for up to a minute, although 20 to 30 seconds is more common. Their short wings allow proficiency at both swimming and flying. However, the transition from water to airborne requires them to get a running start. The roof of their mouth and tongue have backward-facing spines that prevent slippery fish from escaping their grasp. They usually fish relatively close to the breeding colony, not going any further than 10 miles out to sea. Flying back to its nest with a beak full of food is a vulnerable time for the puffin. Predatory seabirds such as the great black-backed gull and arctic skua are just two of the many threats to puffins. Not only are they aggressive, but they are kleptoparasitic, meaning that they make part of their living by stealing the food that other birds catch. They will also prey on adult puffins, knocking them out of the air with their powerful flight and large size. Eggs and chicks can even be pulled from their nests. They are sometimes referred to as avian pirates, or nature's thugs. While the thought of these things happening is very unpleasant, they are doing this to get food for themselves or to bring back to their own young, not just to be a bully. Fortunately for the puffin, they are fast flyers, clocking speeds of up to 55 miles per hour. Each time a puffin returns to its nest able to feed its chick is a victory for the puffin family. The ideal puffin breeding territory is an island of nothing more than rock, soil, and short grasses. Overfishing and pollution decrease the availability of the fish that the puffin so greatly depends on. Also, it is imperative that their breeding space remain inaccessible and free of land predators. Puffins mate for life, reuniting at the breeding grounds each spring. They often greet each other by gently tapping their bills together in a behavior known as billing. Males and females look the same, except that males are slightly larger. They don't build nests as we tend to think of them, but excavate burrows using their beaks and the sharp claws on the ends of their webbed feet. They choose a space under a boulder or in a crevice in the rocks. They line the burrow with grasses and twigs. An established pair will reuse the same burrow year after year. The female lays one egg per year. Both male and female take turns at incubation, which takes about 40 days, and both participate in raising the chick. Unlike the solitude of the winter season, life in the colony is noisy, busy, and a time of community. Puffin pairs and their burrows are densely packed, with only a couple of feet of space between neighbors. To communicate intention, Puffins use body movement as they move through the colony. Head flicking is often used by males to attract a female when standing near a burrow. Or, a puffin might be standing on guard in front of its burrow, defending its territory. Another puffin approaches and does what is known as the low-profile walk, walking quickly with its head lowered. This signals non-aggression and that it doesn't want any trouble and is just passing through. Or it may use the spot stomp, where it remains stationary but raises the feet alternatively. This is a site ownership display and in response to another puffin landing in close proximity. These are just a few of the ways puffins communicate through movement with each other. As I said in the beginning of the video, I really appreciate these birds for all they go through on a daily basis and how devoted they are to their mate and chick. And they're just adorable and endearing. It's hard not to have a soft spot for them. I have never seen a puffin in its natural habitat before, but would love to someday. Have you ever seen one? 
If so, I'd be interested to hear what your experience was like. Feel free to leave a comment down below. Thank you for watching. That's all for this time. I'll see you again soon.